chapter 16. Nearly two years later, Obirika paid another visit to his friend in exile, and the circumstances were less happy. The missionaries had come to Omovia. They had, build, they had built their church there, won a, won a handful of converts, and were already sending evangelists to the surrounding towns and villages. That was a source of great sorrow to the leaders of the clan. But many of them believed that, it, that the strange faith in the white man's God would not last. None of his converts was a man whose word was heeded in the assembly of the people. None of them was a man of title. They were mostly the kind of people that were called efu-lefu, worthless and empty men. The imagery of an efu-lefu in the, in the language of the clan was a man who sold his machete and wore his sheath to battle. Chelo, the priestess of Agbala, called the converts the excrement of the clan, and the new faith was a mad dog that had come to eat it up. What moved Obirika to visit Okonkwo was the sudden appearance of, his, of the latter son, Nwoye, among the missionaries in Umuofia. What are you doing here? Obirika had asked when many, after many difficulties the missionaries had allowed him to speak to the boy. I am one of them, replied Nwoye. How is your father? Obirika asked, not knowing what else to say. I don't know. He is not my father, said Nwoye unhappily. And so Obirika went to Umbanta to see his friend. And he found that Okonkwo did not wish to speak about Nwoye. It was only from Nwoye's mother that he heard scraps of the story. The arrival of the missionaries had caused a considerable stir in the village of Mbanta. There were six of them, and one was a white man. Every man and woman came out to see the white man. The stories about these strange men had grown since one of them had, killed, had been killed in Abame and his iron horse tied to the sacred silk cotton tree. And so everybody came to see the white man. It was, the time of, it was the time of the year when everybody was at home. The harvest was over. When they, all had got, when they had all gathered, the white man began to speak to them. He spoke through an interpreter who was an Igbo man, though his dialect was different and harsh to the ears of Mbanta. Many people laughed at his dialect and the way he used words strangely. Instead of saying myself, he always said, my buttocks. But he was a man of commanding presence and the clansmen listened to him. He said he was one of them as they could see from his color and his language. The other four black men were also their brothers, although one of them did not speak Igbo. The white man was also their brother because they were all sons of God. He told, he told them about his new God, the creator of all the world and all the men and women. He told them that they worshiped false gods, gods of wood and stone. A deep murmur went through the crowd when he said this. He told them that the, tr that the true God lived on high and that all men, when they died, went before him for judgment. Evil men and all the heathen who, were, who in their blindness bowed to the wood and stone were thrown into a fire that burned like palm oil. But good men who worshiped the true God lived forever in his happy kingdom. We have been sent by this great God to ask you to leave your wicked ways and false gods and turn to him so that you may be saved when you die, he said. Your buttocks understands our language, said someone lightheartedly and the crowd laughed. What did he say? The white man asked his interpreter. But before he could answer, another man asked a question. Where's the white man's horse? He asked. The Igbo evangelists consulted among themselves and decided that the man's probably meant bicycle. They told the white man and he smiled benevolently. Tell them, he said, that I shall bring many iron horses when we have settled down among them. Some of them will even ride the iron horse themselves. This was interpreted to them, but very few of them heard. They were talking excitedly among themselves because the white man had said he was going to live among them. They had not thought about that. At this point, an old man said he had a question. Which is this God of yours, he asked. The goddess of the earth, the god of the sky, Ami Amadiora, or the, th or the thunderbolt, or what? The interpreter spoke to the white man, and he immediately gave his answer. All the gods you have named are not gods at all. They are gods of deceit who tell you you're to kill your fellows and destroy innocent children. There's only one true God, and he has, this, he has the earth, the sky, you and me, and all of us. If we leave our gods and follow your God, asked another man, who will protect us from the anger of our neglected gods and ancestors? Your gods are not alive and cannot do you any harm, replied the white man. They are pieces of wood and stone. When this was interpreted to the men of Mbanta, they broke into derisive laughter. The men must be mad, they said to themselves. How else could they say that Ani and Am Amadiora were harmless, and Idemili, and Ogugu too? Some of them began to go away. When the missionaries, then the missionaries burst into song. 
was one of those gay rollicking tunes of evangelism which had the power of plucking at, at silent and dusty chords in the heart of an Igbo man. The interpreter explained each verse to the audience, some of whom now stood enthralled. It was a story of brothers who lived in darkness and in fear, ignorant of the love of God. Told one, it told of one sheep out on the hills, away from the gates of God and from the tender shepherd's care. After singing, the interpreter spoke about the sons of God, whose name was Jesu Christi, Okonkwo, who only stayed in the hope that it might come to chasing the men out of the village or whipping them, now said, you told us with your own mouth that there is only one God. Now you talk about his son. He must have a wife, then, the crowd agreed. I did not say he had a wife, said the interpreter somewhat lamely. Your buttocks said he had a son, said the joker. So he must have a wife, and all of them must have buttocks. The missionary ignored him and went on to talk about the Holy Trinity. At the end of it, Okonkwo was fully convinced that the man was mad. He shrugged his shoulders and went away to tap his afternoon palm wine. But there was a young lad who had been captivated. His name was Nwoye, Okonkwo's first son, and it was not the mad logic of the Trinity that captivated him. He did not understand it. It was the poetry of the new religion, something felt in the marrow. The hymn about brothers who sat in darkness and in fear seemed to answer a vague and persistent question that haunted his young soul. The question of the twins crying in the bush and the question of Ike Mefuna who was killed. He felt a relief within as, as the hymn poured into his parched soul. The words of the hymn were like the drops of frozen rain melting down, melting on the dry palate of the panting, of the panting earth. Noe's callow mind was greatly puzzled. 